the iconic Scottish Highland landscape, with its barren bogs and windswept moors and glens, might be picturesque to some, but it's hard to survive in. The weather is ever changing, there's little trees for shelter or firewood, and bare biodiversity for nourishment. It can be hard enough even with modern tents and camping equipment, therefore I've always been fascinated how Highlanders of the past could spend weeks at a time sleeping out in the open with little more than some big wool blankets and animal skin on their feet. Since 2018, I've been researching and experimenting to see what I could learn from them and from a recent expedition with my friends Jason and Julius from the Smooth Go Fix channel, I learned some new tricks that I believe they could have used. In this video, I'll share some tips and tricks I have learned so far on how I think the 17th century Highlanders met their basic needs of shelter, water, fire and food in this barren mountain, bog and moorland environment. So stay tuned. Hi folks, Tom from Fan Dabby Dozy, thanks for tuning in. So if you're new to this channel, I like to make videos about wilderness survival skills and martial arts, often from a historical perspective. And I have a whole series of videos looking at these topics through the lens of the 17th century Highlander. And one of the main characters, you could say, from this place and time period of history, I like to draw inspiration from, were the Highland Drovers. Now these guys were basically the cowboys of the day. And these men were entrusted to drive cattle from all corners of the Highlands down to the main cattle markets in the central belt of Scotland and sometimes down into England. And on the way, they often had to travel weeks or months at a time, traveling through really remote and barren terrain with no roads, only carrying minimal equipment. So I feel like if we want to learn how to survive in this sort of environment, those Highland Rovers are probably the best guys to learn from. We also have some good historical records on the Drovers' lives, which I use as little pieces of the puzzles to see what equipment and skills they might have used. The rest, I just go out and I experience and I experiment for myself and see what works and see what doesn't work. So if you want some context on the clothing and equipment I'm using, then I recommend checking out my four day Highlander expedition video, as well as my equipment rundown video, if you haven't seen them already. If you want to learn more, you can join me on the Patreon page. There on the tier titled School of the Altan, I release extra learning content and there you'll find an eight part video lesson series on walking staff self-defense, as well as how I do my staff flows and one on historical cooking. Now these videos take on average about three weeks to make, including all the planning, researching, script writing, filming, editing, and sharing. And really becoming a patron is the most consistent way to help me make these videos. And you'd be more than welcome over there on the Patreon community. But without further ado, let's get into it. So I split this video up into the four priorities of survival, these being shelter, water, fire and food. And for each one, I'll share what I have learned and what I think the 17th century Highland Drover would have done to meet each of these priorities when traveling through such a barren landscape. Now, this is a constant learning journey for me and every expedition, I learn something new. And a lot of the footage that I'll share in this video is from a recent historical expedition I did with my buddy Julius from the Smooth Fix channel, as well as my apprentice Jason. This video is the how-to, the equipment and the skills we used on the expedition. But if you want to actually see how the expedition planned out, then head over to Julius's channel where he's released a video showing the whole journey. Now, before I share the actual survival skills, I think it's important to question why the landscape actually looks like this. And did it look like this in the 17th century? Well, a brief overly simplified history of Scotland is that basically Scotland thousands of years ago was once densely forested. Then the climate did shift, it became wetter, and a lot of the forest retreated due to that climate change. However, the majority of this deforestation has been caused by humans, probably slowly to begin with, to make way for settlements and agriculture. But the vast majority of this deforestation has happened within the last sort of four centuries or so, mainly due to the rise of industry, such as shipbuilding and iron smelting. So in the 17th century, potentially much of this deforestation may have already happened. And many of the stories and poems from this time period do describe such an open landscape. However, prior to the Highland clearances, there was much more people 
living and farming in the land, mainly farming with cattle. And just in the nature of the way cattle graze, they're much more selective in what they eat. So potentially the biodiversity of the 17th century would have been a bit different. And there may have been more in the way of edible and medicinal plants for the drovers to use compared to now. Now, after the last Jacobite rising, there was the Highland clearances and many of those cattle farmers were forced off the land to make way for sheep farms and for big Victorian hunting estates where the land was managed to have as many deer and as many grouse as possible so that people could pay to come shoot them. Now sheep and deer can graze much more intensively so having much more of them in the landscape made the land even more barren. Now in the 21st century land use is an ever-changing and quite controversial subject but still the vast majority of the Scottish Highlands is still very much in the Victorian era. So the more you learn about history and ecology, vast landscapes like this stop looking like an untouched wilderness and start to look more like a vast deer and grouse farm. So simply put, I think the landscape would have been pretty similar in the 17th century. However, I believe it's now even more barren and even harder to survive in nowadays compared to the landscape that the 17th century drovers would have traveled through. So with that in mind, let's look at the specific skills starting with shelter. And one of the most common questions I get in my expedition videos is why am I not building some sort of shelter and what happens if it rains? Well, firstly, we have lots of references that the uh, drovers were just sleeping out in the open, just wrapped in their plaids. And secondly, there's not much in the way of resources to build such a shelter. Now, if you read any classic book on the subject of bushcraft and survival, the classic approach to shelter is to use sticks and debris to build basic lean-tos and A-frames. And sure, this is applicable to some environments in some situations, but not out here and not applicable to the 17th century drover, who were generally always on the move, always traveling, and not settled in one place to really build things like that. So when I started this exploration into 17th century Highlander survival, I really had to change my approach to shelter compared to when I first learned. And I had to rely much more on the shape of the land itself. And I've got much better at reading the landscape. The more you learn about the ecology and the plants and why they're growing there, even from a distance, you can tell where is gonna be a good sleep spot. You can see where is gonna be out the wind, what, what ground is gonna be drier and where has got a good water source. So what do I do when I'm trying to find a good sleep spot in this environment with this sort of historical equipment? Well, first of all, I try and find a spot that is out the wind near a water source. I like to find a loch or a river with a rocky bank, which I'll get to why later. Now, yes, you want to be out the wind to, uh, to stop yourself getting too cold, but during the summer when the midge is about, often you do want a little bit of a breeze. So it's finding that spot that's out of the worst of the wind but not completely can, otherwise the midges will eat you. You can then tell by what plants are growing there, how wet the ground is gonna be. So bracken only grows in soil that's consistently dry. So bracken's quite a good indicator that it's gonna be dry. Also bell heather. We have three different types of heather in Scotland. Bell heather is the one that grows in drier soils. So you can use those kind of indicators to know where it's gonna be a good spot to sleep on. So uh, after I found, a spot that's got a, out the wind, but not too out the wind. I then generally either cut a mattress of heather or bracken, or I just put down some sheepskins. Then I'll try to keep moving up until the point I'm ready to sleep. You know, if it's cold, I try to keep active. I'm really kind of trying to time that point of going to sleep, is like when I'm actually tired and when I want to go to sleep. So when it gets to that point, you know, I've kept moving, my body heat is up. I then just want to trap that body heat in my wool blankets. So I've slept in the plaid in different ways and I've got a video on some different ways you can use it to sleep. But my favorite, the last few expeditions, is basically I'll carry two plaids, one that I'm wearing and one that's rolled up in my bedroll. That's my dry sleeping one. So I'll take the one that I'm wearing off and I'll put one half of it down on the mattress. I'll then lie on that. I'll then use my sleeping plaid folded into four and I'll put that on top of me. So I've got four layers of wool to insulate me. I'll then use the other half of the outer plaid, the one I was wearing, to put over me, and I can fling this right over my face 
keep off the midges. I would say the expedition we did with Julius was probably one of the wettest nights I've slept out in the plane. Uh, but honestly, we were all surprised by how warm we felt. Uh, and having that played over me was just like a bivy bag and it repelled majority of the water. A little bit of the water did get in, but having so much wool on me, you know, wool does really well, still keeps us insular to valley even when it's wet. And all of us slept fine despite it raining most of the night. Sure, it's quite unpleasant having to put that soaking wet played on in the morning, but as soon as you get moving again, warm up that wet, then it's not so bad. So after shelter, the next priority of survival is water. Now, finding water in Scotland isn't a problem. We definitely have excess water. But how do people make it safe to drink? Now, the first one I address, there's often a, a misnomer that people think that everyone in the past only drank ale because the water was, wasn't safe to drink. Now, this was certainly true in urban areas where you know the, the main rivers were polluted by everyone's sewage. But out here in the highlands, the water is pretty clean and people were just drinking straight from the streams and rivers. Now remember, germ theory wasn't discovered until the 19th century. So up till then, people didn't know about bacteria and parasites and viruses. They didn't know exactly what was in the water that might make them sick. But probably generally from trial and error, people did know what was a good and bad water source. Now up here in the open hills, if the water source is fast flowing, it's come from high up, it's not flowing through areas with lots of animal activity, vast majority of the time, it's going to be safe to drink straight away. However, there's always a risk. And the only sort of historically accurate way to purify water would be for me to uh, first filter it through my linen scarf and then boil it in some sort of container. However, as I'll get to next, fire isn't always an option out here. I've drank bad water before and honestly, it's not a fun experience. So a lot of the time I do cheat and I do use a modern water filter. My favorite is the grail system. But I reckon drovers of the day would have just drank straight from the streams that are everywhere in this environment. So a good indicator for spotting a fast flowing stream in this sort of a barren environment from a distance is to look for some of the few trees you might find there. As the trees will only grow in places where the deer can't eat them. So you'll usually find the trees either high up on rocky crags or growing out of a tall rock or growing out of the steep banks of a fast flowing river. Again, somewhere that a deer can't get it. So from a distance, if you can notice that a tree, you know, it's not coming out of the crag, it's not obviously from the rock, it's growing somewhere else on the slope. A lot of the time it's growing from a steep bank that's been cut by the river. So straight away, you know, there is a fast flowing water source. Now, how did the drovers carry the water once they found it? Probably in some sort of leather flask like this one. Now, the third priority of survival is fire. Now, lighting fires in this sort of environment, you need to be really careful because after a long dry spell, the heather is really flammable. And also most of the soil type here is peat, which when dry is also flammable. And sometimes when that catches the light, it can smolder and spread underground and cause a real problem. So generally, if you're just camping out here, it's generally recommended just use a modern camping stove. However, I also do believe in proper education about fire so people do it properly. Now, when I light fires out in the wild, most of the time I try light them on the stony banks of a river or loch. So there's no chance I'm gonna get any peat on fire. And I'll also do them a good distance away from any dry vegetation. Now the main ignition source in the 17th century was the flint and steel. Using maybe a charred tin of charred material or amadou to catch those sparks to create an ember. It also makes sense to me that drovers would have probably used any flintlock firearm systems as well as a bit of black powder to get any wet tinder material going if you had to. Now my general approach to fire is what I would call next fire mentality which means every time you get fire going, you use that heat to either create more charred material or dry some tinder to help you make your next fire further along in your journey. Even as you're walking along in your journey, every time you see any decent tinder, you're just picking it as you go, you stick it in your pockets, maybe sticking it down your jacket, close to your body heat, with the idea that 
hopefully you can dry it a little bit for that time that you get to lighten your fire. Now lighting fires in this wet environment in Scotland, it really helps to be prepared before you set off. And I usually always have a pouch of dried plant material attached to my belt for any time I need it. However, on this recent expedition, I'd actually used that dry material on a survival course and I forgot to replenish it. So we had a bit of a struggle getting our fire going, but after several attempts, Jason managed to get some dry or dry-ish heather going. Now, fuel, firewood, really difficult to find in this fire environment too. Uh, you can use the stalks of heather, uh, but this burns really quickly. You can use peat if it's dry enough, but on our expedition, everything was soaking wet. We couldn't use peat. So what we had to resort in doing was using bog pine, which is basically what is left of the old forest. These preserved pine trunks you can find in the bogs. And one of the reasons why they're preserved is because they're full of the pine resin. Um, so if you can get a bit of that, you can tell it's pine because it smells like turpentine and it has an amber color. Uh, and this takes a bit of heat to get it going, but when it gets going, it burns really hot and bright. So luckily we found a bit of bog pine and we got a big enough fire going to dry our feet and cook the one fish that Julius managed to catch. This brings me on to the last priority survival, food. Now in terms of food, it's best to be prepared and at least carry your main energy source of fats and carbohydrates. And we know that drovers were at the very least carrying oatmeal and maybe some butter, maybe some root veg and things like that. Uh, they would have also carried bannock breads or oat cakes. And I have some past videos on how to make that. On our expedition with Julius, we made some bannock breads with some forage material. And I have a video on the Patreon page showing us cooking those exact bannock breads that we took on the expedition with us. Now, of course, the drovers had cattle with them they could utilize for food. Now, I doubt they would have killed any of the cattle because their whole mission is to take the cattle to sell them. They have to keep them alive. But what they probably would have done is to bleed them in a controlled way. Uh, and this was generally done by making a small incision in the neck or in a vein in the leg. You could then bleed the cow and mix this with oatmeal to make a blood pudding. You could then cinch over the wound and the cow is alive as long as you haven't taken liters and liters of blood. Uh, and this blood mixed with the oatmeal makes a really nutritious food, high in protein and high in iron. Now on our expedition, we did do a little bit of fishing, experimenting with some different methods and Julius managed to successfully tease out one small trout out of a lock. Now, if we wanted to harvest deer or grouse, then we would have needed all our licenses and uh, firearms to do that. But to be honest, I don't think a 17th century drover would have had much time to go hunting uh, when their main intention, their main focus is just keeping hundreds of cattle together. Now finally, what sort of edible plants are found out here? Well, as I said, it's pretty barren, but you can find a few bits and bobs such as sorrel, blaeberries, crowberries, um, cowberries, sometimes even cloudberries up high, um, reindeer moss, things like that. So I imagine a drover nibbling and things like that as they travel to give them a little bit extra sugar and vitamins. Now, as I mentioned before, I think that there probably would have been more in the way of wild food in the 17th century compared to now. And I've come across some historical references saying how the rivers in Scotland were just full of salmon. And you know, nowadays salmon population are on decline and they're really hard to catch. Again, same with the trout. You can get trout up here, but they're tiny. And again, I've come across some stories that just seems like the land could provide much more a few hundred years ago. So to me, if you're gonna do one thing to make Scotland easier to survive in for future generations, then plant some trees. Trees will give you shelter. They will control the flow of water. They will give you firewood. And if not directly give you food, they will create a habitat for things like berries and mushrooms and other things to flourish for you to eat. They also give shelter and habitat for things like insects, which in turn feed the trout and salmon. You can tell I'm a forest dweller. Now, <laughs> thanks so much for watching, folks. Really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, again, check out our expedition on Julius's channel if you want to learn more, if you want to support 
then join the Patreon page. I really do appreciate all the support, folks. And yeah, I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Cheers.